Thanks for listening to this Word in Your Ear podcast. If you'd like to get early access to all our productions ad-free, priority booking for our live events, and to take part in our weekly quiz, go to patreon.com slash wordinyourear for more details. Word down your way. You're such a lovely audience. I vividly remember seeing Yes at the Southampton Guildhall in October 1971. In fact, I just dug out my old copy of Fragile. Wow. I remember being blinded by Rick Wakeman's silver cape. And I was just thinking how delighted and how amazed that audience would have been if they'd known that 53 years later the group would be about to go on tour and that one of that lineup is still with them, the excellent yeah. Steve Howe. Steve, it's lovely to see you. Thanks so very much for inviting Very me. nice to see you. Can you, I mean, can you remember that tour specifically, the 1971 um, tour? Well, I'm, 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 you know, my mind's rushing. I mean, they did the Iron Butterfly tour, but I think what you're talking about was just after the Iron Butterfly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We'd, um, we'd, uh, we, we did those shows. I mean, those are the venues that when I get there, I kind of go, oh, I know this place. I've and been I, here I, before, I yeah. Inside out because I've yeah. done so many of them so often. And it's always a thrill. You know, there's something quite magical, you know, about playing in the home of great music, you know, like the Beatles and everybody else. I mean, touring the UK is is delightful, really is. This is time I, I remember was I John Anderson, you, Bill Bruford, yeah. Chris Squire and Rick Wakeman. That was that was yeah. the, what we used to call the classic lineup. It is. It was a, <laughs> it was a great lineup. Sometimes I, I'm amazed how well we did actually play together, and that was the fire or the fuel, you know, that lay beneath us, you know, wrestling inside, and uh, you know, took us forwards, you know, to do albums like Relayer and you know, going for the one and all that stuff. So it was very exciting. So you're actually talking to us now from a studio in Devon that you've pretty much been working in since those days, one way or another. <laughs> it's kind of kind of frightening, yeah. But of course, um, most of, I mean, usually before COVID, my life was split in three ways. You know, I was either here, I was in London with my wife, or I was on tour, you know. But as the tour went sort of like down the tubes for a while, um, I, I, you know, I kept practicing my solo pieces because I knew they were the key to me keeping playing up well. You know, into the uh, into the 2020 era that was that we're now in, almost in the middle of. So, yeah, it was uh, it was good that I, I I could keep my hand in, so to speak, without actually treading the boards. Right. So, do you still work on that stuff all the time? I know Robert Fripp talks yeah. about how he has to play for a few hours every few day. Hours a day, isn't it? That's just right. to be able to well, maintain his fitness kind of thing. I've never I've never had that kind of a regime because I like jamming on guitar. So I've always like improvised and I sit and jam stuff. So when I start playing my pieces, but it's funny you should mention it, but I, I started a series like 15 years ago called Motif, and it took me 15 years to make volume two. And this is what it looks like. And it's sort of right. the guitar, you know, and there's always, you know, like both volumes have new tunes on as well as re-records of tunes that I've either, you know, played with the band or, you know, been on an album somewhere else. So playing solo guitar is really important, you know, to me because Chet Atkins was my biggest inspiration. And one of the things he did great was play on his own. And uh, he made it work on electric guitar, which is really very tough. I love playing it on acoustic guitar, and that's 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 where my area. Besides, you know, I get such a great time with with Yes and the other bands I've been in playing electric guitar. I mean, it you know, whizzing around electric is <laughs> is you know, it's fairly easy <laughs> compared to you know when you actually take on solo for performing. But I love it dearly. Well, can we ask you about some of the first shows that you saw? Can you remember? I mean, you were. We'll get on to you being a musician. I think you were a working musician when you were fourteen. But can you remember the first first gigs you ever went to? Well, I remember the first really important, huge gig, and that was in Lewisham. And I can't quite exactly say when it was, but it was in the early sixties. And it was the first like full on blown, full blown show I went to see. And the bill was uh, Eric Ger uh, Eric Burden and the Animals. Uh, Carl Perkins was actually top of oh. the bill, and yet, oh. guess who stole the show? Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. Oh, oh, I saw that. Didn't you tour. see that tour? I saw that yeah. tour in Bradford. Did you? Know? So, was it also King Size Taylor and the Dominoes? I think, I think you're right. I may have forgotten them. They may, <laughs> may have been slightly more incidental in my my goal. You know, was to see Chuck, obviously, because right. he'd already 
you know, launched his talents, you know, of being a guitarist, songwriter and singer. I'm, you came fully loaded. Right, right. So that was the first thing you saw. Well, it's, it, it's probably like I always say, it's the first thing I saw, and I always say it's all been downhill. All been downhill. Same- <laughs> <laughs> what impression did that leave, though? What, did that, what impression did that make? Well, I guess, it, you know, it was all sowing the seed that, you know, I, I was already playing because I wanted to play. And, you know, he was a guy who, who was, you know, getting on course kind of thing. So, yeah, the the, the projection of, of doing something like that, usually my image was I would, like I am, and usually I'm a guitarist and there's, on to the left of me is a singer. You know, <laughs> and, you know that's been, uh, you know, Tom Ladd, a, a singer in the Syndicats who recently just passed away. I'd like to say sorry about that. And then then it was, uh, you know, um, you know, other guys, Dave, Dave Curtis, he was a he was Yes, of course. Yes. And basically John Anderson and then, you know, then John Wetton. Uh, and so I've always been like, you know, fully in sympathy with the fact that I'm part of the role, you know, part of the role. That didn't stop me being a solo guitarist as well, like I said, Chet and all that inspiration. So I'm kind of running along two channels. Not enough time on the solo guitar, but the, the, hopefully I'll get time to do even more on that. Right, and you right. were playing, you were playing Shadows songs when you were in, in an early group that you were in when you were 14 or whatever. Yeah, the first so it was Hank, I, one of the first great guitar heroes. Definitely Hank, uh, Hank and uh, Dwayne Eddy, you know, they, yeah. they definitely had some, the way they played that guitar was very individual. And uh, yeah, I liked, I liked Hank, to, Hank a lot. And in the first bands, I guess we were doing pop music and a bit of that. I think at school, my first actual gig, if you want to hear this, the first actual gig was was at school in, in, in I don't know, I've forgotten what it's called, Barnsbury Boys School. But anyway, oh, okay. it had an annex, which was very near Holloway, Holloway Road Station. And it was like, it was like, it was an annex, you know, it was a bit like a, not a bomb shelter, but, you know, some other kind of building. It wasn't a real building, in other words. But anyway, I met some guys there and there was this young Scots lad who was, who you know, was a drummer guy. And he said, you know, do you know these songs? I said, yeah. So we actually went on stage in a sort of youth club very near this, this school annex. And we played. It was just ruddy awful. I mean, I, I came Playing off, what kind of stuff? What kind of songs? Can no, you... Shads. We were playing. Shads, Shads. Let me tell you the three problems. With the moves? Did you have the moves? We didn't really tune up. We didn't agree on any <laughs> arrangements and we didn't practice. It was just like a throwing in the deep end. And that was really stupid. But that that's how, if, if somebody said you knew, like, you know, a certain song, you know, you could play it. But obviously there were slight, you know, intricacies. Like yeah. The, and the, the, the kind of the tempo and, you know, the thing. I didn't know anything about playing on stage and I threw myself in the deep end. And I didn't actually play on stage for almost two years after that. So it almost <laughs> put me off. But I think that's when I met a guy called Kevin Driscoll, Tottenham lad, and we started, uh, you know, the, the next phase, you know, the next phase of me actually being in a band, you know, was with with that that lot, so to speak. And um, and you played a gig in a prison, didn't you? Is that right? Well, that was the gig. I actually that those first gigs with with my friend Kevin, uh, as we started seeing the guys, were at the Pentonville Prison Club. It doesn't sound like a great club, does it? Pentonville Prison. No. But the reason they to get in, pray to get out. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, the, you know, some of the convicts came in, and cleared up after us, you know, and. Uh, so that was, you know, it was like playing in, the, mainly we played in a pub called The Swan in Tottenham for years and years. So the 60s, everybody's talking about the 60s, funny enough, it's driving me nuts because everybody like has got some impression about it, which is, I do as well, and it's trying to share that excitement because there was so much great music came out of those early formative years after the rock and roll really got started in the 50s. But by the 60s, you know, you had some great some great producers and some great artists coming out, not least of all, you know, the Beatles and, and the big three. They deserve a, a, a mention. And, the, yeah. It's it's amazing when you consider, yeah. I mean, by, by kind of 1970 or whatever it was, you've joined Yes!, Mm. And you're playing a kind of music mm. that didn't exist three years before that, that or even two years before that time. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, out of psychedelia became a kind of frustration, you know, where, you know, it was a very dark 68, you know, after a very, you know, rainbow colored 67. And somehow I think everybody was trying to find, well, let's find a way forward, you know, let's, let's, let's take all that excitement 
But there again, let's make it uh, even more, um, well, I suppose what Prague was, was, you know, acknowledging more realistically our influences from, from jazz, blues, classical, rock, and and wanting to make something of our own, you know. Uh, and the Beatles were the inspiration, you know. Sgt. Pepper was uh, was no was no mere, um, you know, pop, pop song. It was, a, it was a, a very influential, deep record. But I suppose the difference was with somebody like, with a group like Yes, and you referred to it when we were talking earlier about first being in Devon, mm. you actually played that stuff live. The Beatles weren't doing Sgt. Pepper live. You know, they, they, the Yes music was extraordinarily complex. So but you could You could play it on stage. So how did you do that? Well, it was really because of the t- determination. And, and I guess, you know, I... I I don't want to use it so much in reflection of myself, but the skills of the band did enable some thinking to happen. And, you know, John Anderson wasn't often strumming the guitar. He was often kind of saying, well, how about something that goes over here? Well, couldn't you change key? Or, you know, so we had a kind of guy in the middle who was uh, was also able to, to uh, you know, uh, stimulate and, and create... Ideas. We didn't know what the answers were straight away, but you know, if I played a chord and he said, "Well, that's pretty good," what? What about you know something else? And Rick might go, you know. So it was a very great ar- arranging skill we had, and that's what made our music get more and more complicated. Yeah, yeah. We always waited the longest for Chris, bless him, because he took a while with his parts. But boy, when they got there, were they great? So we we had a chance while Chris was developing his to get ours a bit polished as well, and that's how we made the records with with Eddie Offord. Uh, uh, until the mid seventies, and they they were really really uh, exploratory. You know, we we felt we were always you know climbing over the wall to see what was on the other side. Could we edit this? Could we? You know, we, it was a time of you know putting ideas together. And no one person had the the answers. John had a lot, but no one person had the songs. No one person had right. the, the arrangement skills. It was a collective. But you also. You, you see, you got the PA from I Am Butterfly. That was the story that, yes, we're the first band mm. to have their own PA. Tell us about that. Is that true? It was fantastic. I mean, when we went to meet I Am Butterfly and we did a tour with them, which went around Europe, it ended in Europe, actually. I think it started in the UK. And we heard their PA, PA we were like, oh, that, this is a must-have. You know, I mean, who's got that? They brought it over. And at the end of the tour, we persuaded them to sell it to us. They were quite, you know, they 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 wanted to sell it. They wanted to ship it back and sold it. So that was the priceless sum of five thousand pounds. Thank you very much. Right, that was a hell of a lot of money. A lot of money. A lot we of borrowed money. it, but um, you know, we. But that was the thing that people always said about going to Yes concerts: is that the sound was you so can hear. <laughs> you know, it, it mattered so much because I really remember that with Fragile that you wanted to hear the details of Roundabout and you couldn't work out whether they were going to be able to do this on stage, which you could, and it sounded we, like the record. It's amazing. Yeah, we could play it, and that PA could deliver it because what we what you'd had before, Wem Cabinets and Marshall Cabinets, they were all like four be, four by twelves, you know. But suddenly we had a bass bin, which was a scary looking thing, you know. It looks like the speakers facing the wrong way and then we had mid-range horns which looked really scary you know and then these high frequencies you know so we had the uh, and the mixing desk was a bit like a joe meek studio where you had these rca knobs you know you turned them like this turn the guitar up turn the vocals up but i mean it worked and we bought it and we paid for it and we toured with it and we were extremely proud we we felt this this blew everything off you know the wall so once again we were Climbing over that wall, saying mm. better, you know, how we could be better. So John was encouraging you to, to with musical ideas. Were you encouraging him with the lyric ideas, or did you just sit back and, you know, no. And no, react it, when he came in with mountains, you know, coming out of the lakes and stuff? Well, no, it, it, at that stage, he, he was always looking for me, you know, to kind of get him off the ground as well. I mean, yeah, he yeah. might have chords and structures and then we'd do a, an intro or we'd start developing some instrumental sections I had. And, and John, John would have some instrumental ideas, but obviously he knew if he, if he said to me, oh, what have you got? What, you know, so I would have little things up my sleeve, you know, and I'd play him a, a line or a, a riff or something. And, that, you know, so, but the lyrics, mainly, well, from Close to the Edge, you know, I didn't really write much on, if anything, on Fragile, but Close to the Edge was an open door for me. And, you know, I wrote parts of Close to the Edge, the song. So my lyrics gradually got 
stronger and and John liked them and he would use them in different ways. I might write something very kind of commonplace and he'd twist it around where that was a kind of influence, to, uh, had a world in, worldly influence. Mm. No, so that was his skill. And also, of course, he could he could write more. So I might he might be doing a song uh, like on side four in Tales. And basically, I've got the first verse, you know, I've got a chorus, but you know, that's not a complete song. So with that teamwork, you know, that became, you know, had three verses and, you know, the, the chorus developed more than I had developed it. So all that development is that richness you talk about and the complexity of people saying, well, now I could play that. You think, well, I wasn't planning on you doing that, but wow, it sounds good. So it was the open door. Right. So when Mark and I both saw you in 1971 for the first mm. time, you were the new boy in the group then yeah. at that point. Yeah. I, are you now the, the, the longest serving member? Um, well, you know, I don't go around, you know, with a banner, but yes. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a wonderful confusion, of course, because people in America sometimes call me the original guitarist, you know. But um, I give a lot of credit to Peter Banks. But since since that time, I mean, I I had a a, a pretty fun, you know, ten years out of yes. So yeah. even though I'm the guy who's been in the longest, and I have gone across many many curves, you know, and and gaps, and and I've still been there when you know we took a break here and there. But um, that was that that eighties was very good for me because I, I you know with Asia I kind of established that you know I I could be quite successful but not with yes you know what I mean right yeah it gave me a lot of confidence you know in in my writing and everything not that because Asia wasn't really about my writing so much but so I I, I had a lot of music when we came back and. John came back and saw me and we did Anderson, Booth and Wakeman now. You know, I had a load of songs, you know, and I was like, okay, well, you can take those and you know, mess around with them. And that's sort of what happened with ABWH. And then Judy, and it was more complicated because there's more of it. But basically after that, Keith's Ascension and for a few albums, you know, John and I were, you know, back writing some songs together. And, um, you know, things just move along and up and down, and it's a merry-go-round. <laughs> so, 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 who's the rest of the lo- the lineup for this for this mm-hmm. tour, and how's that going to work? Well, John Davison's been with us the band twelve years now, and uh, <laughs> new boy, yeah, the new boy. Uh, he he's been fantastic, and, and also the teamwork we're doing on the Quest and Mirror to the Sky albums between John and I, uh, you know, has really been nice, and, and we're working on songs, you know, all the time. So on bass, we've got Billy Sherwood, you know, because he was a past member in the sort of magnification, you know, the ladder era of of yes in the early two thousands, and Billy's. You know, he was going to be Chris's step, you know, for the time that Chris was going to get well when Chris Squire didn't get well. So Billy stayed with us, and he's a total Chris Squire nut, you know. I mean, he he, he will be playing one song and he'll twiddle something, and I go, hang on, but that's not the same song. He said, oh, no, I just thought of something Chris used to play, you know. And then, of course, um, Jeff Downs has been back with the band. Of course. The Fly From Here era was about 2011. And he's had, you know, he's a return trip guy because he was with us with Drama, which was a great album to do with Trevor Horn. And basically, Jay Shallon is our new guy because he was helping Alan along the way uh, at the end of Alan's career because Alan was never going to give up. So we had uh, Jay Depp in for him so Alan didn't have to do the whole show. And then uh, now, of course, he is doing, uh, reverse, Jay is doing the whole show. So um, Were you part of the lineup for Owner of a, a Lonely Heart? No. No, oh, you weren't. Though. I am not. No, that that's not that's not an association I have. No, <laughs> right. I was the heat of the moment at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the uh, there must be interesting when you get players in the, in the group who've um, who've grown up studying a member of the group or the sound of the group. You know yeah. what I mean? Do you find in in a sense they kind of know it better than you do because they've sat there and listened to it? Yeah. Uh, you mean a guy coming in and you're. He, yeah. uh, because he's loved yes. No, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And in a way, it would be surprising for somebody to be able to make it work if they didn't have that depth of knowledge about the band, because, you know, it isn't just about one or two songs. It's about a whole damn catalogue, and some of the songs are 20 minutes long. You know? yeah. So that, that, it's something that has to be a bit more inside you yeah. than, than just picking up a, you know, they need a vocalist in yes. I think that, would, that should come with very, you know, a, a lot of due 
thought before you, <laughs> you know, put your name down for that because it's very, very demanding. And fortunately, John Davison's range it, it just is, isn't under question. He's just able. And we're now doing, let me say this, that when you heard us, uh, I think we might have been doing Close to the Edge and All Fragile, but when we every year we've done Close to the Edge until last year, the, the, there's been a key change uh, 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 done in, in Close to the Edge, which is every night I've thought, yeah, you know, if only we didn't have to do that. And so I kind of said, well, like, why the heck are we doing this? I mean, I, I said to John and Billy, you know, I, I could go up here now and, and maybe you could, you know, so we actually are doing it in the right key at the end of Close to the Edge. And that's so satisfying. I mean, we're not doing Close to the Edge this still, but, but when we were doing it then, it was so satisfying because, you know, it, it would be like taking Beethoven you know, simply number five and changing the last key at the end. I mean, why? But it was all moving done. it all up a tone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Presumably just to make it even more challenging to play. You, you well, probably really enjoyed that at the time. What what happened when we recorded it in in, in the studio, then John uh, John Anson said, Oh, I can sing that. You know, it's it's high, you know, it's very high. Of course, Chris can sing high too. But the lead voice does go up pretty high. Well, all we did was was solve the problem. It was given a bit more thought. And it is a lovely thing to be playing the songs in the right key. So that, that we we have a lot of we care, you know, we care about what it is. So how do you work out the set list for a tour like this? Well, I am looked to for that. You know, is Steve going to give his guidance? I have come up with some of the ideas, you know, if not quite a lot of them, just because somebody needs to say, look, you know, I mean, what about this? You know, but there's there's the room to say, oh, well, uh, that song's too close to this one, or maybe, you know, we should revert to, but we did that only last tour, you know. So there's a throwing around, but it does help if I come up with something and uh, it's got the sort of history that, that comes with some of my suggestions. So that that's kind of how we get there, uh, certainly to start with. You don't, you don't always have to start with the same number and finish with the same number. Is there anything like that? Do, do you, are there certain songs you have to play? Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, the encore is is assigned to songs that we we don't control. You know, we're going to play Roundabout, and we're down we're going to play Starship Trooper because that is where we go. You know, that's how we get retro more than in the set. But in the set, no, we feel completely free to go anywhere and take it anywhere. Whether we're playing drama, whether we're playing Time and a Word, you know, whatever album we drop over to and play a song or two from, you know, we've, that's the freedom we have, and and that's the, one of the most enjoyable things. It's it's one of the things I've always hoped for and insisted in my career is that even if I'm not completely free, I want to feel I am, you know, as a musician. And and I think yes, yes is a collaboration of people who want that same feeling. So it's quite often it's easy to agree on a good idea. If it starts with a good idea, then, you know, then then it, we don't have to worry too much. And what can people expect in, in, in the way it's going to look, in the, the, the sense of theatre and... Uh... Well, we got tired of video. You know, we we did video for years and years, and and we suddenly realised that it's a it's a big undertaking. It's a, it's a big thing. You need lots of stuff. And what is it? What's going on while we do while we're worrying about video? Is we're trying to play the music. You know, so we've gone back to a more theatrical, original, yes, style of things where we have a a, a very tight, a nicely designed stage. I mean, it's professional. It's not just like you know, it's not do it yourself stage. So it's a stage that has certain little props, certain little features that will come to light during the show. And they're about lighting, you know, they're under like patterning and colouring and flavouring. So we've really gone into something a, a bit more organic and, and not so computer generated or, you know, not that it was, it was usually out more album sleeves. So we might have a flash of an album sleeve now and again, but in the most part we are, we are lit as... Uh, a, 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 a lovely guy, Mike Mickey Tate, who's who's running, uh, was running Tate Towers. It was his business, and he used to do our lights for us. And, and he he had the, he knew that it was timing. It's all time lighting and theatre is all about timing. And if you know which guy to go over to and say, okay, he's in, everybody else is out. You know, then that's the kind of lighting we wanted. Much more, you know, helpful to the audience. Yeah. Mm. Like, oh, what's going on up there? Oh, yeah. You know, that kind of a show. It's not that kind of a show. I, re I remember reading about Yes in the very early days and hearing them on the radio doing sessions and so forth. And, thought, and, and they were stressed the fact that they really rehearsed. <laughs> you know, that in a, at a time when a lot of groups probably didn't, you know. Yeah. Or even if they did, they pretended they did. Do, yeah. do, you, do you still do that prior to a tour? 
oh, yeah, yeah, we have to. It's crucial. And, and we mustn't get distracted while that's going on. It's very important that you achieve what you set out to do. And But more than that, before that, everybody is expected to do their homework. And mine takes about a week, you know, a week before the rehearsal. You know, I start, no, not all day long, obviously. I know these songs in my blood. But some of them have got twiddly bits. You, 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 you've got to check those out. You've got to make sure you're good on. You can still do the twiddly. Yes. Oh, yeah. But I've got to find them again. They're not all. The, all the complex parts are not all there happily straight away. So a bit of work on those, running the running the running the songs and making sure you're good. So when you arrive, you know you've not only done the programming also because that's part of it. My guitar textures change during the song, so I, I get together with my friend uh, Steve Burnett and we do programs on the guitar for the songs. You know, so each song has got a program. It's got four, four or eight if I want. So I got the textures I want because the guitar is an instrument but the way it works in yes and and so much of popular music is it, it's got the treatments you know mm. whether it's dry clean you know bright dull you know three pickups or you know how many so all that stuff matters whether i'm volume pedaling i've got a wah wah you know that's all part of the song to me i can't really play the song unless i've got a convincing sound that that has somewhat to do with the sound that's on the recording so i enjoy that it gives me guidance <laughs> Rick Wakeman's always talking about, um, very fondly about the tours, and he tells one story which I always thought must be apocryphal, where there was a long instrumental section in the set which didn't require him, and how he went off stage and then came back on with a, a takeaway curry and yeah. sat down and ate it on stage. Was that actually true? I believe it is actually true. It's horrific. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know, it's horrific that anybody would... Anyway, that's Rick, you know. <laughs> it is, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, so you're clearly looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. I, I love the touring, you know. I mean, I, I love it that that it's got more balance now than it used to have, you know, because it used to just come at you like this and you could never say, oh, what are we doing next? Oh, it's another tour, you know, you're getting on a plane to San Francisco. But, um, th yeah, that was up to 2019. But basically... I enjoy it a lot, and also I enjoy the sense of, of pace about it. It's not quite mm. so crazy for long. Right. What have you learned from whatever it is, 60 years of being on stage? What are the key things you've well, learned about well, live performance? I, I would I would just jump to the playing in itself, you know. If 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 you do the right preparation and you get on stage and, and you, you've got you, – I mean, basically, the moment the, when the music starts and I walk out and go, that, that's when I can honestly say – there's nothing else going on but playing this guitar that I love, you know. So basically that, that the, the way you coax that into being satisfying or gratifying or enjoyable for the audience, you know, is a, is a big balance you, you've got to work out as an individual. So basically if you go at it with the right preparation before the show, whatever that is for your taste, and, uh, you know, it should be minimal intake of anything, and just be as clear as you can you get out there because you know if you're in an orchestra you you know you don't go on pissed mm. <laughs> no, you know, but were there any other bands that you learned from specifically any any other well, bands that that you were inspired by well well originally i going back to iron butterfly they were the guys that showed us what an american band does every day you know like hammers this the the practice the the mm. sound check checking the sounds you know getting the bass end right on the bass you know all these things that was there but i mean Really, once Yes got going, we were our own mentors. <laughs> like, sure, we had, mm. you know, Marvish. You know, we 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 loved all the music that that was going on from you know from any era of it. We 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 had great respect for the fellow you know prog prog bands. Um, but you know, it's cliche to say, "Oh, the Beatles, Beatles." But basically, you know, there were lots of bands that influenced us. Uh, too many to 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 consume our time right now. Mm. But yeah, generally, a lot, a lot of music was. I mean, Bob Dylan. You know, his music was inspiring for us individually. So how we we never did any of his songs, but we basically absorbed an awful lot, like everybody else, like you guys mm. did. We absorbed a great deal of the same. Influence. You don't do you don't do any cover versions. You used to do. Yes, you used to do cover versions. Very. I used to love. Yes, his version of Paul Simon's America, and you know. <laughs> Well, that's the only one I was ever part of because right. when I joined, yes, I of kind of screwed it up really for you because I said, <laughs> I don't think we should do any more. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's useful. Useful. They used to do something's coming from West Side Story. 
I used to do loads of things, and just occasionally we drop back and we've done one of those. But but yeah, it's it's not a no no that we do that again. In fact, you know, John Davis and I, I often say to him, you know, we thinking about that song, and he goes, "Do you think yes could do that?" We we kind of toy with the idea. You should. Mm, you should. <laughs> well, you did it. You you individually did a whole album of Dylan covers. Fantastic. I did. Yeah, and sang yeah. a lot of them. Really, were fantastic. Yeah, I sang. I had uh, eight guest vocalists. Yeah, and, uh, including John Anson. And basically, I sang three or four of them myself. So yeah, I've got a, a close connection with Bob. It's funny. I, I wasn't actually thinking on that album, but of course that that was a very enjoyable thing. And one of the first times I felt less of a guitarist for uh, more of a producer because I didn't. Yeah a single word or a single note, you know, but I could arrange the songs. I particularly like the way I did uh, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll, you know, with the mm. classical guitars, you know. So I was trying to bring something different. There's no point in playing the same as Bob, you know. Maybe uh, it, uh, Don't Think Twice It's All Right is, is fairly in a Bob Dylan style on that album because it's country picking guitar. And uh, so, yeah, there was a lot of writers, you know, like James Taylor and, and other people who, who we love so much. And, you know, I loved Alison Krauss and Union Station. I mean, I thought mm. that was just a fantastic musical happening. You know, they were so good. They were so brilliant, so emotional. And uh, to see a band with no amps and they're making that sound was nice. Mm. Well, <laughs> Bob, Bob Dylan is still on tour and so are you. Bob Dylan's on tour with, this summer with uh, Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson, who is 90. That's right, 90, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the whippersnapper supporting him is John Mellencamp, <laughs> 74. <laughs> Me a amazing. child. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't know whether you've seen it, but there is a chart out that, that somebody sent me saying like, my name was on it. And it starts with Willie Nelson, 90, and then it works down. The oh, room. really? Oh, I haven't yeah. seen that. Uh, I'll send it to Sharon. Let's see if she can get it to oh, you. All right, then, because... Yeah. <laughs> but I'm at, I'm at 76, you see. I mean, that's actually 77 this year. But I'm at 77. And I look quite young when you look oh, at it. Absolutely. Like, really young, yeah. Absolutely. There's so many performers still going. The, the only thing I'd say is, yeah, let's keep going while you can still do it at peak level, you know, because I, I, I think it, it, I, I don't want to go on and be, you know, scrubby or, or waste of time for an audience. That would be, that would dissipate everything I've worked for. So yeah. there is a point that you ought to say, yeah, I think this is the cutoff point. I don't know when it happens, but I hope I know because it's the, it'll be the right time. <laughs> well, look, it's been lovely talking to you, Steve. All, all these years since Mark and I saw you. I know. Yeah, I, saw, exactly. I saw you at the LSC and it must have been spring in 1971. And that was that was when Tony Kay was still on the keyboards. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Word down your way. You're such a lovely audience. <laughs>